Those are the headlines. God, I wish they weren't. Gets tonight. It's just been announced. Yeah, thanks. It's just been announced there's to be a special inquiry into the government's handling of the Froome shipping deal, which flew to pieces last month amid accusations of gross ministerial misconduct. Our economics correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan, is with the Minister for Ships, Michael Crane. He's just prized him out of an emergency meeting. I'm with the Minister for Ships, Michael Crane. That's what Crane, Peter, everything I've just said comes spewing straight back out of his stupid meeting. slab of a face. Mr Crane, choppy waters for the government. Not at all, Peter. Um, this procedure was entirely proper, and I think the inquiry will prove that the government's handling of this matter was entirely proper. So the government's ship, back on course? Absolutely. Back to you, Chris. Peter, what the hell was that? This man's made a big-scale cock-up here. You let him get away with it. Now, let me speak to him. Put your earpiece next to his head and stand still. Now, Minister, there's reason to believe that you lied to the House. How do you answer that? Well, that is a very serious and unfounded allegation, and I'll be making a statement to the House based on the preliminary inquiry next week. A week is a long time in politics. Rab Butler. Shut up, Peter. Now, Minister, did you or did you not lie to the House? I will be making a full statement to the House next it's week. It's a simple question, yes or no. Did you or did you not lie? I, um... As the Minister for Ships sprawls on the pin, it's back to you, Chris. No, it isn't, Peter. He's about to answer the question. He's about to admit to lying to the House. You've let him get away again. Where's he gone? Over there. Well, get him back. He's in a cab. Peter, you've lost the news! What are you going to say? Sorry. Look like you mean it. Look down at the ground and say sorry. I'm sorry. Peter, next time you cross the road, don't bother looking. Sorry. Every week on It's Your Blood, we feature an actual bad accident and show how you can avoid a similar fate. This week, Chopper of Doom. Helicopters, machines with blades for cutting air, air that's soft and easy to slice, like human beings. If a helicopter hits the ground at 100 miles an hour, it can be rebuilt. But for a man made of crushable bone and ligaments that tear, it's not quite so easy. In recreating the horrific events of the 12th of December 1992, we persuaded the original victims to face that ordeal again. We also use amateur video footage of the nightmare. All bodily fluids shown are the ones which actually emerged at the time. For this reason and many others, you may find the following sequence produces a very powerful sensation in your brain and body. Farmer Chester Johnson uses a chopper for crop surveillance and he flies it himself. It's 10 o'clock on the birthday of his sheepdog, Lindsay, and Chester has planned him a treat. It was a ride in the helicopter. I knew he'd like it, so I decided to video it for him as a memento. What he didn't know was that he and Lindsay were about to make a flight neither of them would ever forget, even if their brains were erased with mind rubbers. At first, everything was normal. They were up and enjoying the ride. It was smooth and exhilarating, like an aerial motorbike. But then Chester decided to look at his watch, a watch we later found to have a dangerous design. The aircraft was now perilously out of control, and to make matters worse, it was heading straight towards a field of children looking for worms. By sheer luck, a member of the public, Mrs. Maureen Tucker, had noticed the helicopter and started shooting these valuable pictures with her own camera. After ten minutes, she called for help. Hello, control tower. Oh no, it's one of our helicopters out of control. I wonder who that can be. It could be Chester Johnson, and that's got a dog on board. We better call a shepherd then. The steam vulture of Beelzebub was now just seconds away from the children's soft heads. Oh, my. Dear Bill. 
move the stick slightly. Now, where'd, you be, where'd you be? Where'd you be? Steady. Come by. You're doing well. Come by. Come by. By sheer brilliance, the Shepherd Dog Team also managed to avoid an old woman up a stick in a nearby field. While the heroes celebrated, the Shepherd's unattended flock caused a pile-up on the M5 in which 430 people were injured. Mercifully, the ordeal forged such firm bonds between the victims that it led in many cases to marriage. If this happened to you, would you know what to do? Your chances would be improved considerably if you made sure someone on the ground had one of these. It's a pocket shepherd. It costs just 59 pounds, a small price to pay for the gift of a functioning body that works properly. I'm joined now by the Tory chairman for resignation issues, Mr. Austin Straker. Mr. Straker, a bad day for the government? The media always overblows these things, Colin. Mr. Wemby's acted entirely with honour. Minister, thank you. Elwin? Colin? Chris? Elwin? Chris? Elwin? Mr. Wenby's week of hell ended at half past 11 this morning when his resignation was accepted by the Prime Minister. He then walked out of his office for the last time and left Westminster by car <laughs> to meet family and constituents at his house in Gloucestershire where he hopes to spend more time cultivating his hobbies. He is a keen cook and is also fond of collecting stamps. your fast, speedy sports car. No use to you at all tonight, Chris. Thanks very much indeed, Valerie, and I'm sure Alan will agree she certainly is one for a fast car. She certainly is. Um, I prefer something a little bit more comfortable myself. Ah, oh, well, with me, Alan, it's comfort and speed every time. Well, a fast car's a safe car. Of course, in the States, we drive a whole lot slower than you guys. Actually, I think statistically, slower cars are actually more dangerous. Yeah, but you can't be saying we should get rid of the speed limits. No, 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 no. Now the sport with Alan Partridge. Thanks, Chris. And it's a special desk of sport this week as we look forward to all the sporting action that will take place in this year's 1994 World Cup finals in America in Alan Partridge's World Cup countdown to 94. Goal! Yes, 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 yes! That was a goal! Goal! Striker! Eat that! Yeah. And another! Bing bang, stick it in! Thank you and good night! Twat! That was liquid football! Uh. Shit! Did you see that? He must have a foot like a traction engine! Goal! Well, it's cycling championships you're after. You can't say fairer than the Tour de France. Di Brandau there in the lead, swaying from side to side in his own inimitable bike riding way. Klaus been there on the inside, pumping away with his with those gristle-like muscly legs inside the those tight lycra shorts, which have become his trademark. And I don't know what this man is playing at. There's no way. Surely the judges must come down like a ton of bricks on that. Carrying bikes on top of a car is not a sportsmanlike way to run this race. You join me in the helicopter now as we look down on these cyclists that look somehow like cattle in a mad way, but cattle on bikes. And there, Sven Gunsen, closely followed by his great friend and teammate Klaus Ben. And the man with the bikes on his car is, yes, he's disqualified, as I said. And uh, Klaus Spin there wins, riding non-handed. No need for that. The day-to-day. -day. Aware that while the world looks round, it is in fact a cube. And from this, we know that fact times importance equals news. Oxford Street in London with three policemen and a knotted tape barrier. A stray dog was spotted here an hour ago and everybody ran out. <coughs> Police then isolated the area containing the dog and told the public to clear off. 
Later, they located it and conducted a controlled explosion. But as the remains were being taken for laboratory tests, a second dog ran out from the crowd. It could have been a bomb. The police had no choice. It was over in seconds. A dog and three people dead from guns. Being old, they would have died soon anyway. But the dog, which contained no explosive at all, was shot to ribbons in its prime. By six o'clock this evening, a monument had been built, marking the end, perhaps, of the relationship between man and dog, which today went from this to this. The only way police can neutralise bomb dogs is to spray them with a resin coating which hardens instantly to contain any explosion. The inside of the bomb dog is obviously destroyed, but the outside stays the same shape. However, if the underside is not covered, a highly directional blast launches the animal vertically to a height of over a thousand feet. Coming up... New explosive sus laws mean any domestic dog is now a potential hazard. And an eyewitness who was caught up in more bomb dog chaos. Shooting one policeman in particular, I saw it went, No! <coughs> and one guy, I don't know whether he was involved or not, was running away. He went, <coughs> and he caught him one more time between the eyes. It was horrible. <coughs> Um, that, that was as much as I saw, really. The American car company General Motors have today announced a cut in their workforce at their plant in Detroit. Our economics correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan, is there at the moment. Peter, what's going on? Chris, it's a mass redundancy measure. It's the biggest layoff in American industrial history. 35,000 jobs in one fell swoop. Gone. 35,000? Yes. Peter, there's only 25,000 people at the plant. That's right, Chris. Mass redundancy on an unprecedented scale. Well, would you mind telling me how the plant can function on minus 10,000 workers? I don't know, Chris. You tell me. I'll tell you what, Peter. You mean 3,500 workers have been sacked? No. 35,000. It's all here. Let me see what you've got down there. It's 3,500. You're Peter, right. I, I, want a mistake. To I want to see it. I don't want to hear anything more out of your mouth. I don't believe it. Now, show me your notes. No. Yes. It's 3,500. Show me. I don't believe what you're saying. I just want to see the numbers. Now, hold them up. Hold them up and keep them up. And rotate them 180 degrees in my favour. Do it. Peter, what's that? I don't have a monitor, Chris. I can't see what you you're doing. You know what I'm talking about. It's just above your right eye. Yes. A cobweb. And how's a cobweb going to dig you out of your numerical mess? I don't know. Peter, you're lying in a news grave. Do you know what's written on your headstone? News. Peter, thank you. Peter O'Hanrahan, live in Detroit. I'm joined now by the Junior Minister of Health in our one-to-one -one discussion area, Matthew Crean. Now, Mr Crean, you've taken the money out of the NHS. You're the man responsible here. What do you say? I want, I want to say I, I want to discuss this report. Well, let's not discuss this report. Let's discuss the figures. No, We're we have to... to discuss the report because this report is a tissue of lies. It is Hang on a usual... second. Let's just stick to the figures, shall we? You're destroying the lives of patients. What do you say about no, that? No, I want to stick to this report. This report is a tissue of lies. It's completely jaundiced. What are you it's saying? You... Lies? I'm... Absolute lies. It's, it's nonsense from beginning to end. How lies. dare you say this? I want to take... I think this report is a perfect example of tabloid television. Right, and I'm it's not very well... listen to this. I'm not having any more of this. I didn't have any this evening. I certainly didn't. Like you. Now, don't ever come back again. I really don't have any I'm off. I'm not coming back. The day today. Bagpiping fact into news. Hey you! Look at me. I'm driving my sports car. Going at 50, 60. 
70. The wind's in my hair. 80. Oh, look, there's a bend. Who cares? 90. Get out of my way, you squares. I'm doing 100, because it's cool. It's cool to drive fast. Of course it's cool. Just one question. Is this cool? 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 Is that cool? All these people, are they cool? Is this cool? This guy. Cool, is he? This guy. Is he cool? No! This woman. Is she cool? So what about me? Do I look cool? Well, do I? Do I look cool? Do I really look cool? Do I? Do I? Do I? Yes or no? Find out tonight on BBC Two. A week of foul-tempered debate in Europe ended this afternoon as finance ministers agreed new quota rates for trade with the United States. In Brussels is our economics correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan. Hanrahan. Peter, what is the new rate? It's 30%, Chris. Agreement was a long time coming, but in the end, the decision was unanimous. What was the Germans' reaction? Because they've been holding out for 40%, haven't they? That's right. Uh, when I spoke to Finance Minister Reinhardt earlier today, he said he didn't like the deal, but he had to go along with it. Really? You spoke to him yourself. You managed to pin him down. He's a pretty tricky man, isn't he? That's right. Where did you get hold of him? He was in the hotel. And you conducted a conversation with him about the quota rates? That's right. He said he didn't like it, but he had to go along with it. What language did you conduct this conversation in, Peter? German. You spoke to him about the technicalities of the deal in German? Yes. So what's the German for 30 per cent? 30 per cent. 30 per cent. Yes. And what about that quote you attributed to him? I don't like it, but I'll have to go along with it. That's what he said. How did he say it? I don't like it, but I'll have to go along with it. In German, how did he say it? Ich nichten lichten. Presumably you mean rufen Sie ein Taxi bitte, sonst verpasse ich meinen Flug. Yes. No, you don't, Peter, because that means get me a taxi, I'm late for my plane. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Did you speak to the German finance minister about the new deal this afternoon? No. And what was his reaction? I don't know. Peter, thank you. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Riley. That was great. Thanks see you soon. a lot. Take yeah, okay. care. Uh, see you, you soon. You take care too, right? See you tomorrow? I will. Yeah, I hope I so, you. yeah. Okay. Take Thanks. care. Ciao, Chris. Bye. Bye. The BBC has confirmed that it's ditching the nine o'clock news in favour of a new soap opera called The Bureau. It's set in a 24 hour bureau de change. It started just 12 seconds ago on BBC One, so let's dip into it and see what all the fuss is about. Hi, Maria. Didn't see you there. I, I just popped in to see how you were. Don't talk about it now. We'll discuss it later. Yeah, well, that's just, just fine. It's a nice colour you've got in your hair, Angel. What is it? Chilli hot pepper? No, just a bit of henna. You got a problem? No. <laughs> you bloody <laughs> cow! <laughs> This is supposed to be a high-class bureau de change. Not some two-bit punch and duty show down on the seafront at Margate. It's all right, Mr. Hennessy. It's OK now. Just a little misunderstanding. Shut it! Why? Because... Because I'm gay? Is that it? Go on. Say it. You're on borrowed time, sunshine. And as for you, you can pack your bags. You're out! <laughs> and as a result of that broadcast, the crisis has deepened dramatically. I'm joined by our crisis correspondent, Spartacus Mills. Spartacus, this is huge history happening, it, isn't it? It's bigger than that, Chris. It's large. I mean, if you've got a history book at home, take it out, throw it in the bin. It's worthless. The history books now will have to be rewritten. What will they say? They'll quite simply say, John Major punched the Queen. Everything else will be a footnote. A push for time. Can you sum it up in a word? No. A sound? Uh. Spartacus, thank you. John Fashionable. John Fashionable. John Fashionable. 
John Fashionu. John Fashionu. John Fashionu. That's John Fashanu tonight on BBC Two. Well, I, I would say this. I've been working here for 18 years. In 1975, no one died. In 1976, no one died. In 1977, no one died. In 1978, no one died. In 1979, no one died. In 1980, someone died. In 1981, no one died. In 1982, there was the incident with a pigeon. In 1983, no one died. In 1984, no one died. In 1985, no one died. In 1986, I mean, I could go on. Why did they do this to me? Just because I'm gay? I'm gay. I'm gay. What? It's Guy, Mr. Hennity. He's been attacked. Yeah, I know. What do you say? I've said I'm gay. You're fired. What? I'm warning you, Jack Hennity. If Guy goes, we all go. Yeah? Yeah! Yeah! Yeah. yeah! Go on then, walk! The lot of you, walk! I've got people queuing up to work inside this bureau de change. Right. Right. I'm going. Me too. I don't even work here. Yeah, go on, you go and all. But just you remember what you said. myself as an, an individual human being needing salvation receiving it through the work of Jesus Christ do you find the day-to-day -day comes into this at all well how can it not it is day-to-day -day. every day the day-to-day -day. every day day-to-day -day, yeah. for you yes and with a bit of luck for all these people that's what one prays for, what one would like to see. You would like to see the day-to-day -day for all these people today? Um, if your prayer was answered? That they should each enter into an experience of personal salvation. Which would include the day-to-day? -day. Well, how could it not? I don't know what, what kind of salvation you could be talking about that wouldn't include the day-to-day. Today's historic trade agreement between Australia and Hong Kong marks a new season of hope for the future of world trade. The two countries have been at each other's throats for years, but now the hatchet's been buried by a treaty which allows unrestricted trading between all parties at all levels. I'm joined now by Martin Crace, the British Minister with special responsibility for the Commonwealth, and Gavin Hawtrey, the Australian Foreign Secretary in Canberra. Gentlemen, this is pretty historic stuff. Well done. A future of unbridled harmony then, Australia? Yes, I think uh, Martin Crace and I can be uh, pretty satisfied. It's, uh, it's a good day. And if, as in the past, Australia exceed their agreement, what will you do about it? This is a very satisfactory treaty, which I'm sure will work well. Naturally, if the limits were exceeded, then this would be met with a firm line, but I can't see this being uh, necessary. Mr Hawtrey, he's knocking a firm line in your direction. What are you going to do about that? Well, in that case, we just reimposed sanctions as we did last year. Sanctions? Hang on a second. Successful. They've only just swallowed their sanctions and now they're burping them back up in your face. I think sanctions is, is rather premature talk. Certainly, if sanctions were imposed, we should, uh, we should have to retaliate with appropriate measures. But I, I think can't see appropriate measures is a uh, euphemism, Mr Hawtrey. You know what it means. What are you going to do about that? Well, I'd just have to go back to Cabinet. And ask them about what? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's a matter for the military. I... The military? I, I, th I think military measures is totally inappropriate reaction, and, and I think this is way, way over the top. Sounds like you're being inappropriate, are you? Of course I'm not being inappropriate, but Martin Christ knows that full well. This is the sort of misunderstanding that I thought we'd laid to rest during our negotiating period. Misunderstanding it certainly is. It's certainly not a treaty, is it? You're both at each other's throats, you're backing yourselves up with arms. What are you going to do about it? Mr Hawtrey, let me give you a hint. Bang! What are you asking me to say? You know damn well what I'm asking you to say. You're putting yourself in a situation of armed conflict. What are you plunging yourself into? You'd like me to say it? I want you to say it, yes. You want the word? The word! I will not flinch. You will not flinch from? War. War. 
Gentlemen, I'll put you on hold. If fighting did break out, it will probably occur in Eastman's town in the Upper Cataracts on the Australia-Hong Kong border. Our reporter Donald Bethlehem is there now. Donald, what's the atmosphere like? Tension here is very high, Chris. The stretched twig of peace is at melting point. People here are literally bursting with war. This is very much a country that's going to blow up in its face. Well, gentlemen, it seems you have little option now but to declare war immediately. Well, this is quite impossible. I couldn't take such a decision without referring to my superior, Chris Patton. He he's in Hong Kong. Good, because he's on the line now via satellite. Mr Patton, what do you think of the idea of a war now? I'll take that as a yes. Very well, it's war. War it is. That's it, Chris. It's war. War has broken out. This is the war. That's it. Yes, it's war. From now on, the day to day will be providing the most immediate coverage of any war ever fought. On the front line and in your face, Donald Bethlehem. Standing by, Douglas Hurd. The day to day smart bombs have nose mounted cameras. This is Smart Bomb Stephen, and that is Susanna Gekeloys. I'll be reporting from inside the fight. Like some crazy Trojan. And keeping an eye on everything that's going on out there at the day to day news pipe, Douglas Trox. Chris, the first the weather from Sylvester Stewart. As I swirled the last traces of toothpaste from my mouth this morning, a soldier's head flew past the window, shouting the word victory. Seems to be a lot of action behind you there. Have you seen any fighting yourself? Today, I saw an old woman on the ground. She was lying in a pool of her own tomatoes. Thank you, Donald. Earlier today, I've been down among the fighting myself. This is my report. There's something about the way these people move that tells you they are a nation at war. Look into their eyes and you can read the words, I have a reservation at the restaurant of death. It's a messy bistro with a bad name for soiling its customers' clothes. We've seen only one napkin in four days. The people here are confused, spending most of their time running about like idiots. Earlier today, we met a family who, thanks to this war, now have no home. A war which they feel anyway has nothing to do with them. This is not our war. We are being forced to swallow the rotten egg of an angry political goose. That boy is now a war orphan. One more victim of what they call here the desert confetti. I have a child about his age myself. When I phoned him ten minutes ago, I told him to move out of the house to make room for his new brother. It's been revealed that the junior Treasury Minister, Michael Portillo, carries a sawn-off shotgun to constituency meetings, corners children in parks and chews their cheeks, and has frequent sexual intercourse with stray animals, claiming, as long as it's got a backbone, I'll do it. That story we reported last week and have since discovered it to be untrue. Time now for Alan Partridge. Got some sport for us? Certainly have, Chris. Great. And just some late-night soccer results. Here they are for, t for Division 2. Sheffield Bonanza 1, Dynamo Aberdare 4, Manchester Coherent 2, Jill Morrell 2. And the Scottish Division 1 game between Taste of Dunfermline and Strath Carnage cannot be stopped. Good night. Due to a printing error, tomorrow's Guardian is full of water. That's it. That's the day today on the day the world learned that Cliff Richard is pregnant. Good night. <laughs>